Could I ask you to take your seats, please? Seems to work. Well, thank you all and good evening. My name is John McGoldrick. I'm a friend, as most of you are, of the Institute, and it is my pleasure tonight to introduce to you our speaker, Luke Viscons Visconti, who is a friend of the Institute himself, along with his wife, Nancy, and is here with us this evening uh, as count in his capacity as the founder and CEO of Diversity Inc. Media. For those of you who do not know Diversity Inc. Media, it's primarily a consulting company with over 60 major corporate clients, but also publishes a magazine and website which reaches more than 200,000 people monthly. Uh, the magazine and website cover broad topics ranging from the current status of employment case law to the revelations of the culture of the National Football League and the Miami Dolphins locker room. Luke is going to share his insights on why the topic of diversity is so popular with corporate America's senior leadership. You are likely aware of diversity initiatives in local businesses, corporations, and institutions, but you might not know exactly what that means today. Luke is going to tell us. He's also going to talk about how companies manage diversity and comment on the connection between diversity and superior corporate performance. Now I'm going to, uh, <clears throat> before turning it to Luke, going to impart a small anecdote of my own which relates to diversity in one dimension, and there are many dimensions as Luke will say. Some of you will know of Lou Gerstner. Lou was the CEO of uh, IBM for a long time and other companies, very good business person. And he was uh, on the board of a company where it was my job to prepare people to speak to the board who typically didn't speak to the board. And there are some tricks of that trade, but it's pretty straightforward, uh, except you needed to get people ready for Lou Gerstner, because Lou was among the best directors I think I've ever seen. His questions were trenchant, short, right on the point, and sometimes out of left field. Uh, and he had a certain style of asking the question. He would be typically very quiet in a meeting, and then there would be some version of an outburst. What? What do you mean? What? And this took people aback, they had to get ready for it. <clears throat> and I remember one example, a uh, se very senior person in the R&D field of this company was uh, presenting a plan for a new facility somewhere in the northeast of uh, the United States. And it was actually a very straightforward, easy board item. And in the middle of it, what? Lou was at work. And he said, and I think I can remember it close to verbatim, he said something like, let me get this straight. You're in the intellectual property business, right? Your products are all related to ideas. And yet, you are once again bringing us a new facility in a small corner of a relatively small 
continent, relatively small country in a small continent. And why are you doing that? Why aren't you building your facilities all over the place so you can get different perspectives from people of different cultures? Well, there were some answers to that, and the outcome of it is unimportant, but it, it illustrates a very good point I think he was quite right about, that diversity comes in lots of forms, and diversity of ideas is among the most important. Now, Luke is a real expert in this, and will elaborate on it for the rest of the evening. He's a graduate of Rutgers University, where he serves as a trustee. Been busy recently, haven't you, in that? Um, he also serves as chair of the New Jersey City University, its foundation board, and as a trustee of Bennett College, a, an historically black college in Greensboro, North Carolina. <clears throat> He's actually a retired active duty naval officer, uh, an aviator who flew helicopters and tells me he's back in the air again now. And he's now a member of the Chief of Naval Operations Executive Panel. And last but not least, Luke serves on the Friends of the Institute Executive Committee. Please welcome Luke Visconti. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I need to log into this. This is kind of an intimidating thing when you think about it. There's, um, it's a mix of people from the Institute. My wife is here. Two of my, uh, three of my closest co-workers are here. It's a very intimidating kind of thing. And I'm much more um, happy talking to CEOs where I know that I'll be on the plane in a few minutes and I'll be out of town. <laughs> I actually have to live here now. So um, I think that the anecdote um, that John just talked about is so true, it's so on it. The ultimate benefit of this subject is diversity of thought. Uh, the ultimate place where companies want to be is to have as many people around the table to give them perspectives and, and ways of attacking problems and addressing opportunities as possible. And what creates that diversity of thought is what, comes, what we all come to the table with, our background, how we grew up, what happened to us along the way, where we went to school, how we went to school, all of those things contribute to how we approach things. So that companies today, that in a very rapidly evolving um, uh, global marketplace, need all the good ideas they can. And I'm gonna take you through some things that I believe are changing where uh, our un the United States and, and also what's going on globally and how that affects companies. First, I want to start, this is a billboard in LA right now. Um, it's for a product called Snore Stop, and there is a soldier with a Muslim woman, and they're married. Now, when I first saw this, or they're hugging, you don't know who they are. When I first saw this, I thought to myself, that's a really crass promotion. That's pulling on a lot of strings. We've been fighting two wars in their neck of the woods for 10 years, and here's a soldier hugging a woman who's clearly dressed in Muslim garb. I did some research on it. They're married. This is an actual couple. They met while he, he's still on active duty. And so this is a real couple, and they're advertising, they're being paid to advertise this product. I also thought this picture was very interesting. Shawarma. That hasn't been around in the United States, but now it's fairly common. You could buy it right down on Route 27, kebabs. And in the background, there's a liquor store. Well, Muslims don't drink liquor. It's very interesting, isn't it? I mean, this one little picture says so much about the United States and where we're going. And I, and I think it's, it's just, it's very interesting because this is what our society is. And there's some reasons that I think things have changed. And, this is a somewhat complicated slide. The dark blue line is the ratio of workers per retiree. So that you could see, shortly after World War II, there were eight workers per retiree. And that's drifted down to where there's four workers per retiree today. And soon, in 2025, there'll be three workers per retiree. Now, on the right side, on a percentage, and I'm counting multiple, this is women. And then we're gonna go talk about the demographics of the workforce, and this is the demographics of the workforce. So if you think about it, in 1960, there were 21% of the workforce were women. 
and I could not find numbers on this, but I guarantee you 90, 95, maybe 99% of those women were working as admin, domestic workers, nurses, and school teachers. So why did these things change? I could not find numbers for black people in the workforce in 1960. Now my theory for this is, they were 10% of our population in 1960. My theory for this is that Franklin Roosevelt had to compromise with Southern Senators to pass the Social Security Act in 1934. The compromise was to exclude two groups of people, two groups of workers uh, from the Social Security Act, and that was domestic workers and farm workers, which basically described 99% of the Southern black workforce. So I'm an entrepreneur, I have to pay my payroll, I pay a social security tax on my employees that they don't even see. It's a little over 7%. So um, one benefit to the southern um, farm owners, plantation owners, where they did not have to pay social security tax on their workers, where you know, at other workers in other industries in the industrialized north, they did have to pay that social security tax. The second thing is, if I can keep your family down by causing you to pay for your own old people. So if you've got mom and dad at home and you know, Aunt Jane, and, and they don't have Social Security, but another family does have Social Security, that's an economic burden that you're putting on one group of people that another group of people don't have. So when you think about it, it was a very good compromise for the Southern Senators because they were able to continue to oppress their black workers through a number of different economic ways. So now why wouldn't the government look at this? Why wouldn't they count black workers? Well. Also as an entrepreneur, I know that the most e efficient and effective branch of the government is the Internal Revenue Service. If you miss a quarterly tax payment, they're right on the phone asking you how you're doing, you know, did you forget about us? They're very effective. What I think this is all about is tax revenue. The government knows that it needs, to, if it wants to continue to spend money the way it spends, it needs to continue bringing in tax revenue. And so when you think about it, as the workforce aged, we needed to pull more people into the workforce. So let's talk a little bit about our history between 1960 and now. Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act of 1964 and 1965. Most Americans don't know that immigration reform in 1965, for the first time in American history, stopped immigration quotas based on race. That right up until 1965, there were quotas on race for immigration. That was changed in 1965, then you have the Community Reinvestment Act of 1977, the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, the recent legislation around uh, gay marriage. There's, there's been enormous change in our society. Why? I think it was necessary to pull people into the economy to counteract the aging of our workforce. We're at a kind of an inflection point. Um, the CBO says that we can no longer tax. Any further taxation will result in a reduction of total tax revenue. There is a disincentive. Uh, my, I'm personally in roughly the 54% tax bracket. And frankly, you know, how much more work do I want to do for less than half of what I take home? And if the percentage went up, I would probably let some things go. So think about that. We're at an inflection point. We're also borrowing far more money than we can afford to pay back. So what's going on? Because you've got a real issue here. So if you look at today's workforce, it's almost 50% women. Why isn't it 50% women? Anybody have a guess? Which gender bears 100% of the children? At any given time, there's going to be a certain percentage of women going into labor. And that's why it's slightly less than 50%. If you look at college educated and non-college educated workforce, we're at par, men are at par with women. And then if you add black, Asian, Latino, other is more than one. That's the new census definition. It's 88% of the workforce. Now you're double counting some people here. But add in people with disabilities and LGBT. You know what LGBT is? Okay. Um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, for those of you who didn't want to nod your head no. Um, <laughs> now you're at over 100%. So think about this. What's mainstream today? What's mainstream? There's no such thing anymore. And when you look at this, this is our reality of how we have to manage our country. And I think there's some other things going on. Um, I did this slide for, I was able to brief all of the three and four star generals of the Marine Corps, which was a very interesting experience. So I used the same ratio of workers per retiree. The red bar is Great Britain. 
So Great Britain started out with an older workforce, and they are older than us now. The dashed line is percent of GDP spent on defense. Um, our military is uh, larger than the next 17 militaries added together. And we've gone from, uh, we've gone down during the Clinton years and then back up, uh, and Great Britain went down and stayed down. And in fact, they're closer to 2% today. And I made the point to the Marine Corps generals that uh, right now we have roughly 240,000 Marines, that proportional uh, with the GDP in our population that we would end up at with 40,000 Marines instead of 240,000. And I said, you can't invade Connecticut with 40,000 Marines, right? <laughs> so if you think about it, there's some real pressures. Right now, we're spending 7.3% of our GDP on Medicaid, Medicare, and Social Security. The CBO estimates by 2037 that that'll be roughly 16%. The Affordable Care Act, we spent zero last year. Depends on whose estimates you're looking at, but $500 million, um, or excuse me, $500 billion next year for the Affordable Care Act. This is a real squeeze. What's going to happen to the things that we think are permanent, like aircraft carriers and large military? Um, I think it's going to change. And here's another reason why I think it's going to change. Here's the demographics of the last presidential election. The president. Uh, running an economy that was worse than anything since 1934, won the election handily. 56% of the people who voted for him were white. 55% um, uh, women voted for the president. Uh, his largest, the president's largest demographic was 18 to 29 year olds. Governor Romney's largest demographic were those over 65. And 88% of the people who voted for him were white. So if you think about it, if you're Coca-Cola um, or you're Johnson & Johnson, which demographic would you prefer to have? And which demographic do you think in the short term is going to end up getting its way? I think, uh, by the way, this looks almost identical to the millennial generation um, uh, uh, demographics. And the millennial generation is going to be more than 50% of the workforce by 2018. So it's something to think about. Here's something else. Um, there's the millennial generation demographics, Generation X, baby boomers, 73% white versus 59% white for the uh, millennial generation. A and think about this. There were more non-white births than white births in this country last year, a result of immigration reform. Things have changed quite dramatically in a short period of time. What's kind of interesting to me about where our society is going, I would not have predicted 10 years ago that gay marriage would be a reality. And yet, here it is. Things evolve very rapidly. I actually had a ringside seat to this because I knew that if we can get rid of don't ask, don't tell, that we would get rid of every other thing. And it's still the law in most states where you could be fired simply by saying, I'm gay, and it's perfectly legal for your employer to fire you. These things are all going to go away because our country could deal with a lot of things, but I don't care how red the state is. If somebody comes back with a combat infantry badge and a silver star and a couple of purple hearts, there's no way they're going to allow that person to be discriminated against. And that's what changed our society. So when you think about what's going on, the millennial generation has far different attitudes about this than the baby boomer or the silent generation. But I think I've seen you know, the, the fact that more than 50% of Americans are now in favor of gay marriage tells me that that kind of permeated you know, the attitude of the younger people is permeated into all of our families. And when you think about it, you know, you, you know Uncle Ralph, the confirmed bachelor who could never find the right woman, he's 52. Well, now he can come to Thanksgiving with John, his partner. And that's happened to a lot of American families. And if you think about the number of non-white people, it's likely that your child is going to date or come home or marry someone who's not of your race. And these things have brought themselves into our society, and I think have changed it quite a bit. So the Affordable Care Act, which I believe is the president's answer to getting more work people into the workplace. So I want you to think about this. There's 40 million uninsured people in this country. Most of them are black and Latino. Now, if you don't have health insurance, and your child has a 103 fever, and you can't afford to go to the doctor, are, are you going to work that day? No, you're incapacitated. You can't really even get out of Maslow's lowest rungs. There's no way that you can get yourself to work. So I think this is something that is part of how do we pull people back into the workforce. 
Governor Romney wasn't wrong when he talked about the 47% that are not engaged in the economy. He could have been more tactful, it would have helped him, but he wasn't incorrect about it. 47% of the electorate will be non-white by 2020. Now, I'm talking about this because these are motivations. Uh, I had an interview with SEC Commissioner Aguilar, who is the guy who put most of the language into effect about board of directors being responsible for diversity. And his rationale, by the way, he's an immigrant. Uh, he, he's from Cuba. You ever hear of a Peter Pan baby? These were kids who were sent by their parents to the United States alone. He came to this country as a toddler. He had no family here. His parents sent him here hoping that he would have a better life than he could possibly have in Cuba. And he lived in the Cuban community. Very interesting guy. He's a lawyer, very successful. He told me a, a story that he was in high school in Texas. And he was invited home by one of his friends. And he was sitting at dinner. And he realized, as his, the friend's parents were asking him questions, that he was actually in an interview process. And he wasn't sure what it was about. And at the end of the dinner, the mother said, we know you don't have any place to live. Would you like to become part of this family? Yeah. So he put the language into who's responsible for a lack of diversity. If your bank is too big to fail and the taxpayers have to pick up the tab, shouldn't the taxpayers have some representation in your senior management and your board of directors? Shouldn't you be responsible as corporate executives for managing this? Because it's all of us citizens that pick up those tabs. And uh, that's what his philosophy is, and that's why I think you've seen an increased emphasis on this in corporate America. Now, one more, oh, I made this point. This picture is the nine flat top picture from last holiday season that in Virginia Beach, uh, nine aircraft carriers and marine amphibious assault ships were all lined up uh, for the crew to go home for the holidays. And so the question is, do we want aircraft carriers or do we want MRI machines? And I think the voters have been pretty much decisive on where this country is going. So think about that. There's something else that's going on. Our country and um, most of Europe is aging. We're aging. They're aging. All of the industrialized countries are aging. Japan is not at replacement birth rate. Their population is shrinking. Here's where all the young people live across the middle of the world. So if you think about the global middle class, which is exploding. There's all, you know, the global middle class, there's fewer people who are hungry, illiterate, more people in the middle class, it's growing tremendously. Here's the global demand for food. So think about what the future has in store for us, how we fit into the global economy, what pressures companies are facing, this need for thought diversity, and what's likely to be important to the world in the future, and I'm going to bring this around to the Institute at the end of the talk. We, um, the, the publication is necessary for the consultancy. The publication has made it very important for companies to be on our diversity in the top 50 companies for diversity list. We determine this list by a 300 field survey that we send out once a year. It's free. Companies can apply, any company with more than 1,000 people, not-for-profit, for-profit. Um, and what's interesting is it, it, it's a very onerous task to fill out this survey. It's very intrusive. We ask questions on, on talent pipeline, talent development, senior leadership accountability, and supplier diversity. And they're very intrusive questions, very granular. We crunch, crunch it through SAS and, and come up with correlations between how companies express themselves as outcome, that's expressed in human capital, and the business practices they use to get to the best outcome, that's the basis of our consultancy. We measure by industry category, so you can see Sodexo, which provides, in essence, uh, cafeteria and facilities management services to large corporations and schools, um, can compete equally with PricewaterhouseCoopers. It's far easier for Sodexo, which employs mostly semi-skilled and unskilled labor, to get diversity uh, than it is for PricewaterhouseCoopers, but because we measure inside industry, we can get them to both compete together. You'll see that there's a huge spread of knowledge worker companies and labor-intensive companies. All four of the big four accounting firms are on the list. IBM and Accenture are here. These are all companies that give us their data willingly, 
We then aggregate the data and provide consulting and benchmarking services with it. We also can tell from the data that there's five stages of diversity management. There's only four on this slide because stage zero is nothing. You're doing nothing, which I would say 10 years ago described the overwhelming majority of the Fortune 500. Um, today, that's less than half of the Fortune 500 are doing nothing. And by the way, one thing I forgot to mention, this list expressed as a stock index outperforms the NASDAQ, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and the S&P 500 on a one, three, five, and 10-year basis. So can you draw a direct line between diversity management and stock price? No. I think you can draw a direct line between diversity management and superior corporate governance. That results in, in stock performance. So if we look at this, stage one, and there's a sombrero up there, why? You get tacos in the cafeteria on May 5th. That's the big diversity effort, Cinco de Mayo tacos. Right? So there's a lot of companies, and you know what? There's nothing wrong with celebrations, and there's nothing wrong with tacos, but it's not really a good diversity program. Stage two is where you see most of the companies on the top 50, that's where they're focused. They're focused on their own workforce, recruitment, retention, this, the topic of engagement, if you know what that is. Wikipedia actually has a really good definition of it, but it's a person's adherence to their job, how excited they are, how involved they are. Higher engagement is low, equals lower turnover, higher productivity, less accidents on the shop floor, those kinds of things. So these are companies with structured diversity um, in place, diversity programs in place. More than half of the diversity in the top 50 now have a, an executive diversity council, which at the better running companies, and I want to just point out one thing, there is a huge difference between roughly here and up and here and down. There's an order of magnitude difference in results between companies 40 to 50 and 1 through 10. So this isn't a list of peers, it's just a list. The results vary considerably, and then when you get off of this list, they plunge. So there's companies sending us data that think they're doing very well, and then they end up understanding where they actually are. It's, it's, it's kind of interesting. So this is structured now. A lot of companies, when they first get into this, don't like the concept of goals. But goals are necessary. You have to have goals. Quotas are illegal. Goals are necessary to accomplish business results. And I'll give you a great example. I was, we benchmarked a small engineering company, about 30,000 employees. And for the last three years, they've had the same problem. They're recruiting people with less diversity than they currently have in their own workforce, and that diversity isn't very good. So if you look at the shifting demographics of college students, for example, Rutgers is in its third year of graduating more non-white people than white people. This is the trend. They're really not in good shape if they're going in the opposite direction of the entire country. And their problem is that their recruiting people do a very good job of pulling in diversity with the resumes and qualified people, but they have 2,500 hiring managers and 30,000 people. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And that's where it's going wrong. The people who are anything other than white men are not being hired, even though they admit that they're qualified. Why? We are predisposed to most trust people who look just like us. And if you're going to, mat and you know, there's good reasons for that. I actually have, I have a column on the website called Ask the White Guy, which is a joke. It's, I'm not the impotent white guy. I, I, it was a, I met a guy at an insurance company who was the chief diversity officer. He was an African-American guy. And um, he was miserable in his job. I could tell he was miserable. So I said, you know, how did you get this job? And he looked at me and he said, I was the vice president of sales in the Southeast. I had 300 salespeople reporting to me. But I happened to be at headquarters when the chief executive officer found out we were being hit with a class action suit. And I was walking down the hall. He came out of his office and he said, you, you're our new chief diversity officer. So I figured, okay, if the CEO had to ask the black guy, then everybody else can ask me. I actually got a question from a professor of biology at a Midwest public university who said, well, if Eskimos can handle the cold better than people in Thailand and black people score lower on SATs than white people, don't you think there's an element of intelligence and genetics with race? And so if you do the research, what you find out is that the genesis say we're all one human race and that there is an actual um, equal likelihood of me having similar um, genetics to a black person than to a white person and that what we perceive as race, skin color, hair texture, eye folds, 
is less than 4% of our genome and has no connection to intelligence. So why do we see dominant sense, vision, right? Why do we want to see this race and why is it important? If you go to the Human Genomic Project on National Geographic's in version 2, you'll find that we're all from Africa. That, that they've done hundreds of thousands of cheek swabs, people sent it in, and they've proven we're all from Africa. And it wasn't that long ago. Our genetics haven't evolved all that much, so what are we doing in Africa? We're hunting and gathering. So if your tribe, John, gets to the antelope before my tribe, you eat, I go hungry. If it happens a second day in a row, I'm going to kill you. And I'll probably eat you. So think about that. The nature of tribe is very important to human beings. You know, and going back to the military, we have 1,800 uh, nuclear weapons on active duty, another 7,000 in strategic reserve. We are currently spending billions of dollars to develop the next generation of nuclear weapon and billions more to, gener to develop the next generation of manned bombers. Why? Because if you get to the antelope, I'm going to have to kill you again. You know, so it's, that's why we do things. Tribe is very important. So you need management to break through tribe. Now, when you get to the place in management where you could develop relationships equitably and you turn that to your marketplace, you make a lot more money. And if you can then understand how this connects to innovation and how your relationships with people and pulling people together and giving people the ability to express their differences in, in ways they're going to approach a problem, that makes the most money of all. And, I, and I'll tell you that this concept of tribe is what prevents us from getting there. And, and um, I purposefully didn't wear a tie today um, because I think it's absolutely crazy for most people, to, you know, men, to get up in the morning and tightly knot a piece of cloth around their neck. You know, <laughs> why would you do that? And the answer is because when you walk into a business room, Tribe says you need to be wearing a tie. And if I walk into a room in Florida and it's warm and I'm in flip-flops, uh, golf shorts, and a, and, a, and a golf shirt, people will say, well, he's you know, dressed for the beach, certainly not dressed for business. Tribe is very important. The problem with innovation is that we all have to manage what we do right now and then manage the innovation that will get us to where we need to go. The world's first digital camera is in a glass case in Rochester, New York, in Kodak's headquarters. They just came out of bankruptcy. And from what I understand, there were literally fistfights in meetings between the film people and the digital people. And the digital people did not win quickly enough for them to prevent going into bankruptcy. So we all have a, this, this problem exists. Every company has this problem. The Institute has this problem. How do you innovate and maintain doing what you're doing? How do you keep the process going while getting that innovation together? That's a tension that exists in every organization. But there's a reason to conquer this, and I think that um, this is Enrico Moretti. This is from Enrico Moretti's book, The New Geography of Jobs. And what he's showing is that people are now clustering to a large degree. And it was, it's interesting, if you think back just 100 years ago, the overwhelming majority of human beings were born, grew up, and died within 50 miles of each other. There's a, a whole thing about, um, Mark Twain wrote about uh, Jesus, his whole life was in a very small geographic area, and yet he created a religion that has lasted all of these years. You think about the impact of, of people, but you know, most people don't, didn't get very far. And today, they could travel anywhere. Today's graduates, do not feel the geographic impediment. I have a friend who speaks to his parents in China by Skype every day. The impediment, remember, most of us are baby boomers in here. Remember when we were kids, long distance, and your parents would run around the house, long distance, long distance. Well, it was $3 a minute, and you only made $15,000 a year. It was important to get on the phone. Now there isn't that at all. So people can go to where they want to go, and it's interesting because I get asked to speak at a lot of economic development events, mostly at cities that are dying. So I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee. The city's dying. And like most cities that are dying, they have a black and Latino school district surrounded by a wealthy white school district. The black and Latino kids get systemic child abuse that results in them not being able to ever be employed again because they haven't been educated, where the white school districts get a different outcome. The problem for the parents in Knoxville is that the kids go to college and don't return to Knoxville. And this is what Marie Enrico Moretti's talking about, is that college educated towns with a higher 
percentage of college educated people are getting a higher percentage and towns with lower are getting a lower percentage, which he shows drifts down to wages even for non-college educated people. It's the same thing that's happening with universities, corporations, the talent is clustering because it can and communications are very easy. Now, speaking of communications, my business will never die because stupid people making dopey remarks will never stop happening. So this woman gets out and says, well, of course I use the N-word. And the, that wasn't the issue. I don't think that was the issue. The apology was the issue. And she said, your color of your skin, your religion, your sexual preference does not matter to me. Who I am matters to me. Doesn't what you are matter to you? If you're black, don't you think that that matters to them? I, I, you know, to a black person? If you're a woman, isn't that important to you? Who does Paula Dean think she is to say that what you are doesn't matter to me? That is a common thread. You hear it all the time. I don't care if you're black, yellow, purple, green, or polka dot. We've all heard this. It is what kills relationships. <laughs> it really is. And that is the, you know, when you get right down to it, that's what companies have to manage past. She's not a bad person. I don't even think she's a bigot, even though she used that word. And apparently the restaurant her husband was running was a really not a nice place to work. Bottom line is she was oblivious. And that causes a problem. Now, there are companies that do better than, than just serendipity. But I want to point something out to you. This is the percentage of women. The top bar is CEO and direct reports. The next bar is one level below that are people reporting to those folks. And the bottom bar are people reporting to the second level. So think about this. This is women representation. Um, the top 50, top level, CEO and direct reports, 25.9%. What percentage of women of that age group earned four-year degrees? What, what percentage of four-year degrees were earned by women in, in that age group? Over half. Over half, women have been getting more bachelor, more bachelor degrees than men since the late 1980s. So what happened? Oh, well, I guess they left to have children. So if I figured out a way of taking 24.1% of your money out of your wallet every day, would you say that's OK, Lou? Go right ahead? No. But we allowed, corporate America allowed all of these folks to walk off and do something else with their lives. It doesn't make any sense. And if you look at the greater scheme of things, um, on the 10-year period, more than half the Fortune 500 companies cease to exist. So that's a kind of an interesting thing. Gender is still for far more of an axis of discrimination than race, according to our data. So you look at the top 10, they achieve different results. Look at the bottom quarter. Now, this is the bottom quarter of all companies that submitted data to us. These are companies that thought they were doing really well. And look at the difference between the top and the bottom. This is black, Latinos, and Asians, the same percentage. You'll notice in the top 10 and the top 50 that they outperform the available labor pool. That's pretty good. Now, why would they outperform the available labor pool? Especially, I, I like this level here on the top 50, that the top level is more diverse than the next level down. Do you, do you know why? If any of you ever shot sporting clays or clay pigeons, you, you go to where the target's going to be, the old hockey analogy. You don't go where the puck is now, you go to where you think the puck's going to be. There's a direct connection between diversity at the top of the organization and retention. So they're, they're looking at this and saying, we need to have this visible diversity because our tribal instincts, our vision, will tell us that we're not really welcome here past a certain point, and they'll leave. I actually was in a study with the Navy addressing regrettable loss of mid-grade women officers. And, um, we were able to talk to a group of women who resigned their commission. And for those of you who had a commission, when you resign, it takes a year to process out. And I remember going to my boss, uh, Commander Zinzer, who had a Navy Cross from Vietnam. He was a helicopter pilot, and he flew into a, a rice paddy to pick up a guy who was shot down after dark, and the rice paddy was surrounded by people who wanted to kill the two of them. So the bottom line is uh, I had to stand in front of him, and, and when he understood what I was going to say, when he realized I was going to tell him I was resigning my commission, he made me get to attention, he started yelling at me because it wasn't a good deal for him to have to lose a you know, fleet lieutenant who's going to resign his commission. Every woman told us they were congratulated 
by their commanding officer. Congratulations, I guess you're going to start a family, right? So my question, because the Navy said, well, ask them if they feel adequately mentored and supported in their career. And they said yes to that. I asked, when do you think you'll see the first woman chief of naval operations? And they all said, well, I don't know, 30 years from now? Now think about that. If, if you're talented and you think you have the potential to be chief of naval operations, and you don't think there's any way a woman's going to be selected for that spot, why would you stay? So the first people to leave are your best and brightest, and what you're left with are the people who will deal with the situation as it is. As it turned out, it's very interesting. Did you know the one area at that time where women were not permitted to serve was submarines? So the, the chief of submarines said, well, there's no way. We can't have women on the boats because you know, the showers and there's not enough birthing facilities. So after he left, you know, we were you know, the little committee, and I said, look, if, if, he, if the admiral doesn't know where to go to Walmart to buy a shower curtain, I'll buy that. That's OK. We can live with that. But here's the solution. The, 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 the problem is you have unsustainable, regrettable loss of women mid-grade officers. More than a proportional share of admiralties you know, go to submariners. The solution is to cap the promotion of submariners above mid-grade until you get enough women admirals that the regrettable loss stops. Three weeks later, women were allowed on the submarines. Three weeks. And I went to the Naval Academy, and I talked to the guy, the detailer, who assigns the jobs of the graduating midshipmen. And I said, what happened when you opened up the jobs for submarines? And he said, the entire academic top of the women class to a woman volunteered for subs. I said, did you ask why? He said, oh, we were very interested in that. And he said, the women all answered, we want to be an admiral someday. <laughs> so you see, management of this and what you see and what you can expect play into how much you're going to contribute to the organization. Um, there's some things that directly connect to this. Structured, formalized mentoring, resource groups, very important, and a diversity council with teeth. Um, there's a big difference, consumer products companies, between over time, this is women managers promoted, the delta between the companies that are doing this well, P&G, Kraft, Colgate, Palmolive, General Mills, and Kellogg's, very different from other CPG companies that submitted data to us. And so that brings me to the Institute. And where I think, well, let me show you something. Um, here's the faculty. Okay. Um, let's see if I can get to this. I don't know. Do, do, uh, I think we've all seen the faculty picture. Um, it's very white and very male. The top line actually has some diversity in it, but the rest of it's very white and very male. So where is the institute going? For what is it set up to do? And where are we heading with this? And Peter, you gave me the book, The History of, of the Institute, which I found to be a fascinating book. And when Lewis Bamberger finally committed to funding the Institute, it was because he was Jewish and he was very concerned about the Jewish scientists and Adolf Hitler was elected chancellor. And there was a real need to get people out of there and into a place where they could have intellectual freedom. And it worked out quite well for the, our, the, our country and the whole world. So where are we heading? That was then. Think about the relative youth of the industrialized, the people of the industrialized countries, that we could send millions of people into the battlefield, millions of casualties. We couldn't do that now. It's literally impossible for us because we don't have the young people to send into the meat grinder. And if you think about what was important then, struggles, I, I, one of my favorite books is Peter Drucker wrote a book called Adventures of a Bystander, and he talked about the difference of between what World War I destroyed, which was the, the, the royalty, the oligarchs, the, the, the big wealthy people in Europe was destroyed by World War I, and then the, the end of World War II basically created modern management. It's very interesting when you see it from his perspective, and, and it was a series of anecdotes, a very good book. So you think about where is the Institute going? In the last uh, executive committee meeting, um, the director of the Institute, Robert, talked about how st st unstructured research money from the federal government is drying up. 
that it's tens of millions of dollars a year to the institute, and it's going away. Why is it going away? That's why it's going away. The problems that we had in 1932 are completely different than the problems we have in 2013. And can we be positioned to be relevant to the problems if, if the question is how do we get more money out of the federal government, if the question is how do we get more donations from the corporations that donate a ton of money, If you're going to be relevant to these folks, what do we need to be doing? What do we need to be thinking about? What kind of people need to be here? And where's the direction of the institute going? To me, that's how diversity impacts this very important, very, very important Institute for Advanced Study. And that's where I want to leave you with uh, on the talk today, and I think we have time for a couple questions. But the bottom line is, if all of these folks are so involved with this that they'd give my little company 300 fields of very intrusive data, then we should all be thinking about this. Because this, I think, my wife and I contribute. We're friends. We donate it far higher than the minimal level. And I'm yet Mr. Diversity Inc. guy. And this is in a very diverse place. Why am I donating here? Because I think the mission of this place is so important that it's important for us to support it. And the cocktail parties are pretty good. <laughs> and the wine list is excellent. But the bottom line is we believe that this is important. And so it was kind of nice to be invited here to talk about this because I'm hoping that I can maybe be a catalyst for thought here so that we evolve. We, the institute, the institute community evolves to continue to serve humankind and be relevant to what we do. So I'll leave you with that and uh, ask you if you have any questions. Thank you. Now, I live in the neighborhood, so I could stand here all day. I mean, I'm going to waste some questions, and I don't have to go anytime soon. Any questions? Yes, sir. Hey, Greg. Uh, that was a wonderful uh, talk, and it's nice to see you in action. You know, Luke's one of my neighbors. But um, what's your data show on business schools? Because they're putting out the leaders of some of these corporations. What's happening there? That's a very interesting question, and in fact, um, uh, one of the things that I'm proudest of at Rutgers University is we have this thing called Rutgers, Rutgers Future Scholars. There's 1,200 kids in this program now. We take them in eighth grade from uh, where we have a campus, so Camden, Newark, Piscataway, New Brunswick, and then we mentor them, and last year was the first year we had our seniors graduate, the first class graduated. And out of 200 kids in the senior class, uh, 197 of them graduated from high school, and over 80%, I believe the final percentage was 86% went on to college. Their cohorts from the schools that they came from were far less than half as successful. So if you think about it, and there's a kid I have in my, in my office, he's an intern. Uh, Jason's mom died two years ago. I get this email, and, and Jason's mom's dead. And I know his dad's in prison. So I get him on the cell phone, and I go, Jason, what, you know, what's going on? And he said, I, I don't know what's going to happen to me. And I said, tell me what's going on. He said, my grandparents are coming up from driving up from Georgia, and they want me to go home with them. I said, well, do you want to go to Georgia? And he said, no, I'll lose my scholarship. Part of the thing is, if you get into the Future Scholars Program and you are academically qualified, you go to Rutgers for free. So he's all concerned. I said, well, what's your immediate problem? He said, I don't have anywhere to live. And I said, is that because you can't pay rent? And he said, yes. <laughs> I said, do you have a bank account? And he said, yes, Mr. Colson set it up for me as another donor. So I said, I'll wire money to you. Mr. Colson will pay your rent. Don't worry about a thing. Sit tight. We'll find you a foster family in New Brunswick. You will graduate from New Brunswick High School, and you will go to Rutgers. And he's going to Rutgers now. He's a freshman. My point is, we have 1,200 people and 1,000 in the active program, 200 that graduated. I took a percentage of our endowment at Rutgers versus the number of undergraduates that we have and did a ratio with the number of Rutgers Future Scholars. And then I took a, a ratio of Princeton's endowment and the number of undergraduates they have and came up with the answer that they should have, proportionally, 172,000 children in a Rutgers Future Scholars program. Do you know what, how many they have? 
24. 24. So I would tell you that, depends on the business school that you're talking about, that there is a social commitment that some schools have that other schools do not feel. If you look, for example, at the percentage of students at Princeton and all the Ivy Leagues, Pell Grants, you know, that's the way the poorest kids get Pell Grants to go to school, it's a far lower percentage than the average for America, certainly less, far less than almost half of what Rutgers is. So you think about it, the B schools, the top ones, Wharton, Harvard, not doing a great job. And that's a problem. Now I will say this, more than half of B school students and law school students are women. And if we can't do better than 25.9%, we are turning people out that their brains will never contribute um, in the corporate sense to our GDP. I think they're contributing in a lot of other ways, but not in, in this, this sense with these companies. So I would tell you that we could do a lot better academically. Now, being on these boards, what you're hearing from the federal government, who foots the bill for a lot of things, is that they are looking at outcome. They want to know how much do your graduates make. And they want to know, you know how many graduate within six years and, and what do they make on the outcome because they're the ones backing up the loans and the grants and they want productivity out of this because the ratio of workers per retiree is declining and they need more people to pay taxes. So they're looking to get an ROI out of their investment. But that's a great question. I think we could do a lot better. There is this tension between how we do things and innovation and where we need to go. Think about this. We imprisoned seven times the per capita average of people than the rest of the world. Seven times the per capita average. More than half of prisoners are black and Latino. We've been fighting a 40-year war on drugs. You don't fight a war for 40 years unless somebody's winning, right? <laughs> There's just this, impri this the imprisonment industrial thing, prison industrial complex, a lot of people making money off of this. So we now rank 17th out of 50 industrialized countries for public education outcome, and we've got a prison industrial complex. There's tension between the film guys and the digital guys here, you see. And our government is, you know, you ever see a full metal jacket where the drill instructor says, choke yourself to one of the recruits and you go like this? That's what we're doing. By not enforcing standards by which public education has, by outcome, we are hurting ourselves. Kids go home for the summer in Camden and Trenton and Newark. Why? To tend the crops. They go home at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Why? The cows have to be milked. There's no cows in Trenton. There's no cows in Newark. And there's nothing to do in the summer. So the schools need to be open 724, 365, frankly, and serve three hot meals a day. Look, can we all talk about responsibilities and having children you can't afford? Sure. But what are we going to do with the kids? There's children there. They're innocent. And it's the future of our country. So it was a long-winded answer to your question. There's another question? I won't be so long-winded the next time. <laughs> Oh, IT comes a very interesting question. We're in the middle of reporting on um, a, a series of IT companies. Every company has to submit an EEO-1 form to the government, and that describes the demographics of their workforce. There's nine IT companies, all the Silicon Valley companies, Microsoft, who have decided that they've sued to protect the EEO data so it isn't publicly released. They're saying it's a competitive disadvantage for them to release the data. It's because they are so astoundingly not diverse that they don't want the negative publicity. <laughs> so that's what's really going on. There's, they, they're actually having their lawyers engage with the federal government to avoid releasing data that would show how pathetic they are at recruit, recruiting a cross-section in the United States. Now, anybody who's used Windows lately knows what happens when innovation dies. <laughs> I mean, frankly. So, you know. <laughs> and you think about it, you know, now that, now that Steve Jobs is dead, who's going, where do you see the innovation coming from? I mean, you think about the miracle of putting your finger on a piece of glass and moving stuff around. It's amazing. Where's that next innovation going to come from? I don't see it. Yes, sir. Is the Catholic Church trying to be rich? Or <laughs> <laughs> no. Or the, Cat Republican Party? the Republican Party should be. In fact, I reached out. <laughs> I, I actually know the guy who was the military advisor to Governor Romney. And there was, you know, I don't remember if it was the congressman, the medical doctor who said fetuses masturbate or something. It was one of those wild things that you read in the paper. 
and I, I emailed them. I said, you know, it doesn't have to be this way. The country's better off with two strong parties, not one mediocre party and another party busy dazzling itself with gasoline and playing with matches. We are not going in the right direction. We need two strong parties with good ideas that can come together in Congress and negotiate. And, but they're not interested. I, I think that there's tension now that the analysis of the last election is saying we, we've got to move in another direction. And you know, George W. Bush got 40% of the Latino vote in, the first, in his first election cycle, so it's not like the Latinos are a given. And that's going to be 30% of our population by 2043. So the Republicans could stage a huge comeback in a very short period of time. That's a, another thing that you know, companies say, well, how long does this take? We have on, on this list a very interesting company, um, Rockwell Collins, headquartered in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Now, their former just retired CEO, Clay Jones, came to one of our events, and he got in front of our podium, and to 600 people in the audience, he said, it's going to be tough because we're headquartered in Cedar Rapids, and there's not much diversity in Cedar Rapids, but I promise you we will be on this list, and they are. I mean, they did what they had to do. Most of their employees are in Cedar Rapids, and they recruited people and make sure they stayed. That's a big trick. Cedar Rapids is a fine little town. It's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just if you're black, there's no, there's no black church there. There's, you know, if, you're, if you want to get any else sort of ethnic food, it just doesn't exist. But they're making it happen in Cedar Rapids because he's interested in the innovation of thought, the, that diversity of thought. But that's a great question. No, I don't have any. And it's interesting. My customers, people think, well, gee, all these companies that are in trouble, they must come to you. They're the last ones to come to me. They are. The companies that do this the best are the ones who have CEOs who are truly invested in this. Now, sometimes they come to me from a lawsuit. Sodexo, Novartis, Coca-Cola, these are companies that went through some really bad lawsuits. Novartis had a lawsuit recently. It was their salespeople. Um, they had a road manager in the sales department. And he said some truly horrible things to women over a prolonged period of time. They formed a class action, got class action status. I got a phone call, what do you think? I read through the court suit, and I said, you've got to settle this before the sun goes down. Do not. Do not continue to fight this. That's not us. You have our data. I said, I know that's not you, but you've got a rogue executive who did some truly horrible things. It cost them a billion dollars. They lost the court case. Lost it. Now, they have 50% women reporting to the CEO in scientific positions. 50%. Their CEO is a Swiss guy, Andre Viss, a, a huge proponent of this, very disciplined man, also former Swiss military, he, he's truly on top of this. He was disgusted at the lawsuit. This is us, this is what, not what we're supposed to be, and he made sure it would never happen again. Sodexo went through a similar process, Coca-Cola went through a similar process. So sometimes it is a lawsuit that wakes up top management to see what's really in the mirror, and when it's not pleasant, they change. But the truly, the recalcitrantly bad people, they don't ever come to me. Because, you know, when I'm, got two speeds. I'm awake or I'm asleep. I don't do the nice diversity talk and I go into places and I tell people, to, and I get thrown out of places. There's places I'm not welcome at anymore. That's okay. I got plenty of customers. So, is that it? One more question. Thank you. I think your was fabulous. Thank you. website is our YouTube or how could I um, share what you've been yeah, saying with other people my children and any other friends I have a column with a, a column called ask the white guys get 300 I'm over 300 columns I've written so far you can read that there is some video we're, we're working hard video is now preferred by our audience more than text it's flip-flopped and we have a middle-aged audience and and so people are really consuming and 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 it's becoming dominant that people are watching us on phones so you'll see more and more. There's stuff on the website, though. Yeah, absolutely. Diversityinc.com. We have a couple more questions. I'm standing between you and cocktails and dinner, so this could, got, could get ugly. Can you say a few words about how companies or places of higher education or whatever um, outside of the U.S. are thinking about diversity? That's a really good question. We're in our fourth year of global research, and we focus on women because that's the constant. You know, what, di what is described as a minority is different around the world. If just looking at women, when you go away from the United States and the, the UK and the former Commonwealth countries, 
it falls off like a stone. It's just terrible. So um, WeBank, which is the certifying organization that certifies women in business enterprises, has a global initiative called WeConnect. They estimate that only 2% of business equity worldwide is held by women. And when they said that to me, I said, my God, if it were 50%, warfare would end tomorrow. And they're like, yeah, that's right. So you think about you know, where, where that is. It's not a really great place in the rest of the world. And it's kind of good that you asked that question because we could, we could end on a positive. This country still exceeds anywhere on the place of the earth that you can come here and achieve more of your human potential than anywhere else on the planet. So with all of our problems and our trajectory, and you think about the Civil Rights Era and all those things I talked about, Community Reinvention Act 1977, Americans with Disability Act 1990, we are still better, a better place for anyone anywhere in the world to come to, to become, be able to achieve what's in their potential better here than anywhere else on the planet. So it, it does drop off far rapidly, but I will tell you something about that. Very interesting. I have a friend who is, um, a retired Egyptian army officer. And before the overthrow of the government, he said, you need to come to Egypt and have a diversity conference. And I said, why? And he looked at me, he's my age, and he looked at me and went like this, and he said, our wives are on the internet. And I started laughing, because he said, they want to know why they can't be lawyers and doctors, and they've got the education, and it's creating a lot of problems at home. And I said, that's a very good reason. And, but then the government got overthrown. So think about what's going on in the middle here, right? And all of the governments that have been overthrown, and the ability for people to communicate, and how people are organizing themselves in Syria, and how they did it in Tunisia and Egypt. What's going on is very interesting, and it is that tension between the haves and the have-nots, and the discrimination that goes on in those countries, um, and the tension now that people have, uh, it's interesting, if you look up Africa and cell phone usage, you'll see pictures of cell phone charging stations. All these cell phones are plugged in. And when I first saw it, I said, man, why is there a cell phone? Then I realized, these are folks with cell phones that don't have electricity in their houses. How cool is that? You know, you could, you could text them, they're there, they don't have electricity. So they've, they've jumped three generations of communication. This process is going to speed up, but outside the United States, it's not very good. One more question? No more, okay. Thank you very much for the questions. Thank you for coming here and spending some time with me. I appreciate it. Thank you.